Four or five years ago, I did a review on the DJI Action 2, and I found that I actually preferred the footage out of my iPhone, and I felt like my iPhone was a better action camera than the action camera itself. Okay, and yeah. you've always disagreed with me. Yes. People in the comments have always disagreed with me. The number one complaint is, this is an apples to oranges comparison because the action camera's 500 bucks and your phone's 1,000. And I say, that's insane. I have the phone anyway, so in theory, the phone is free. But just to go along with this argument, I have some new action cameras and you're gonna test them. I've got the new one from DJI. Okay. I've got the new one from GoPro. And I've got my two-year-old iPhone that happens to be worth almost the exact same price as these action cameras. So if you're the type of person that doesn't want to use your phone because you might break it or whatever. We all have an old phone in a You have an old phone, around. yeah, in your bedside table, or you can go on eBay or Facebook Marketplace and buy one right now. I'm curious to know, is a two-year-old phone still better than an action camera, or have these action cameras gotten so good now that they're gonna destroy phones? I have to believe that, but I gotta prove you wrong. Do it. So I'm a little hesitant to even put an iPhone in this test, but I have Lee's older iPhone 14 Pro, and so I'm gonna put it in the mix. Now I wanna warn everybody, this isn't the type of review that's gonna get super nerdy. I'm not going to start shooting in log and applying a bunch of LUTs. I just wanna make this review super simple, and I just simply wanna know what camera is easier to use, what camera has the sharpest image quality when shooting at, say, 4K at 60 frames per second. I wanna know what stabilization looks best, and which camera captures the most dynamic range. So if you're one of those pixel peepers who often misses the forest for the trees, well, this type of review video is probably not gonna be for you. All right, let's start this off with the low light performance because I think this is going to be a huge difference between these three cameras. Each of these cameras have a different sensor size. The Action 5 has a one over 1.3 inch sensor. The Hero 13 Black has a one over 1.9 inch sensor. And the latest iPhones, they have a one over 1.28 inch sensor, making it the largest sensor of all three cameras. So the Action 5 Pro actually has the biggest disadvantage because in theory, the photo site should be smaller, which is never good for low light. That said, the Action 5 Pro is the only camera with a dedicated night mode called Super Night Mode with AI noise reduction, and the GoPro's night mode is only available in time-lapse, which is kind of weird. And the iPhone, it has a long shutter option, but that's only available for stills and not video. Now, since faster frame rates need more light, I put all of these cameras in 24 frames per second so that in theory, the cameras have more time to drag the shutter, let more light in, and produce a better low light video. But as you can see, the GoPro video looks the worst. The iPhone 14 Pro with its wide angle lens isn't great, but somehow the Action 5 is by far the best looking of the three. I'm gonna put some more footage up on the screen so that you can make your own decision, but for me, this is kind of counterintuitive and I definitely have to give the advantage to the DJI Action 5 Pro. The footage that you're seeing right now is the standard quality that I almost set all of my cameras to at all times. This is 4K, 60 frames per second, and we've set the stabilization in camera to the most basic setting. Keep in mind, both action cameras do have a boosted second stage of stabilization, as well as a horizon steady mode, whereas the iPhone really only has this one single action mode, which lowers the quality from 4K to 2.8K. So all of the footage from the iPhone has been scaled up just a little bit because it is a lower quality having that stabilization turned on. I've made up my own opinion with this test, but which camera of these three do you think looks best? Let's quickly talk about the video quality that you can get off these cameras. The Action 5 Pro can shoot 4K at 24, 30, 60, and 120 frames per second, and has a maximum bit rate of 100 megabits per second. The GoPro 13, however, can do all of those frame rates at 4K, but it also can shoot natively at 5.3K and shoot up to 60 frames per second and has a maximum bit rate of 120 megabits per second. So on paper, the GoPro 13 is definitely the more powerful camera because it has a higher resolution and shoots at a higher max bit rate. All right, iPhone, it's now your turn. Depending on what phone you own, this is the iPhone 14 Pro, you're going to be able to shoot 4K with 24, 30, and 60 frames per second. Apple doesn't advertise the bitrate quite as clearly, but it seems that this can shoot about 100 megabits per second, so it's in the same ballpark as these other cameras. Now, in this example, I've changed the GoPro to 5.3K to see if the higher resolution adds sharpness and clarity. 
I'm not so sure that I see a big difference here, but maybe you do. All right, let's talk about slow motion. The Action 5 Pro can do 4K all the way up to 120 frames per second, but you can get 240 frames per second if you lower the quality down to 1080. The Hero 13 Black has the exact same options, but you are gonna get more resolution at 240 frames per second because you can shoot this camera at 2.7K instead of having to drop it down to 1080. So the GoPro does definitely win when it comes to shooting higher quality slow motion, but I do have to say it's pretty rare that I shoot at 240 frames per second. I'm more likely to shoot at 60 or even 120 frames, and both of these cameras can shoot 4K in that frame rate. Now when it comes to the iPhone, slow motion is kind of its Achilles heel. You can shoot 120 and 240 frames per second, but you're gonna be stuck at 1080 resolution unless you have the new iPhone 16, which allows you to bump up that resolution to 4K, which is much more comparable to these action cameras. The Action 5 Pro cannot stabilize the native slow motion footage, but the GoPro 13 Black can do that in camera. For me, I always shoot slow motion by just shooting a higher frame rate and then importing it into Premiere, scrubbing through it, finding the best clips, and then slowing it down after I've captured it. So for me, filming slow motion that's embedded in a 24 frames per second file in the camera is not something that's all that important to me. But if you shoot and edit on the go and you want that stabilization built into the slow motion file natively, the GoPro definitely has the winning edge there. So here are some videos shot at 120 frames per second. The Action 5 and the Hero 13 are both in 4K, but the iPhone 14 is upscaled two times because it's still stuck in 1080. For all of these shots, I have adjusted the white balance and contrast just a little bit to make them look a little more similar. Obviously the framing isn't exactly the same, but which one do you find most enjoyable to look at? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about form factor next. As you can see, the GoPro and the Action 5 Pro are almost identical in size, and they both have a forward-facing screen so that if you put this, say, on your wakeboard or your kiteboarding or something and the camera is facing towards you, you can still frame up the shot and make sure that it looks great. The Action 5 Pro has a touch screen on the front, whereas the GoPro screen is simply for reference only. And while the iPhone can reverse its cameras so that you could preview yourself for FaceTime, when you're using the best cameras on any iPhone, you are left not knowing exactly how your framing looks because at the moment, no iPhone has a forward-facing LCD screen. All of these cameras are waterproof. The Action 5 Pro is good for 25 feet underwater, where the GoPro 13 is good for 33 feet underwater, which for me is perfect for any kind of water sports, taking this into the water park, putting it in the pool, maybe even some low scuba diving and snorkeling. But you are gonna have to use the supplemental underwater casing if you wanna take this down below 20 or 33 feet. How wet you wanna get your iPhone without an underwater case? Well. I'm gonna leave that up to you. All right, so I'm here at the beach and Lee just showed up while I'm doing this review. I'm gonna go ask him if he minds me taking his iPhone action camera into the ocean. Hey, do you mind if I take your iPhone into the ocean? I would prefer that not go in the ocean without a waterproof case. But it's the action cam. It's, it's an action cam with the waterproof case that we do not have. Oh, so you need a case for this. Okay, another reason why this is not the perfect action camera. While we're talking about form factor, one thing that I love about the Action 5 Pro is that they have this magnetic quick mount. I can take the camera off this mounting system really quickly. So if I need to recharge the battery or transfer footage or do something like that, I don't have to undo all of this. I can just snap the camera right back on top. GoPro has recently released this same sort of mechanism. It's about 25 bucks and it doesn't come with the camera. But regardless of what action camera you wind up buying, I think that this new mount system is great. In fact, I wanna have two of these so that I can mount one camera on one athlete, send them off. And while they're out there getting footage, I can spend some time gripping up another camera location. And then when the camera comes back to me, I can just take this off, snap it on. It makes it super easy. I'm not fumbling with these little screws. One thing that I hate with all of these action cameras is how difficult it is to remove the micro SD card. I don't know why they haven't come up with a better way to push a button and have the card eject, but unless you have really long fingernails, I can never get these cards to snap out of these cameras. That said, both cameras do have a USB-C port so that you can easily plug a cable into the camera, transfer the footage maybe even faster than you would if you had to take the micro SD card out and then connect it to that weird little adapter that we always lose. And it also offers really fast charging. So while this isn't a new feature on this camera, I really appreciate all of my devices having USB-C. While I'm mentioning these latches, I do kind of also find that the latches on the GoPro, 
I don't know, they just, I feel like I'm always about to break a nail when I'm trying to open these. I feel like they're just harder to snap open. Maybe if I give this enough time, I will find that one of these latches is more fail-proof and more waterproof. But for me, I really appreciate the way that the DJI sides open. You just push a button and slide it. It seems like a really minor grievance, but for me, I definitely enjoy opening up these little latches on the DJI camera more than I do on the GoPro. Now let's talk about the iPhone. If you're gonna be buying a cheaper phone on eBay or using the old phone that you've upgraded from, you're probably gonna have an iPhone 14 or older, and unfortunately, they use that lightning bolt cable which transfers files at a crippling speed. And so if you want USB-C, you're gonna have to buy the iPhone 15 or 16, which is a much more expensive camera. And if you are gonna use an older iPhone for your main content creating camera, I would recommend having a pro version because yes, you want the ultra wide angle camera, which we're gonna be using to compare with these action cameras, but the real advantage that the iPhone has is that you have that two and three X telephoto reach. You can actually zoom in a little bit more digitally. And so this camera has the advantage of being able to give you many more options, but you're only gonna get that with the pro model, which definitely costs more money. Another thing with the iPhone is this is much harder to mount. For this review video, I'm just using the spring latch system. And when I mount this, part of my screen is blocked. And because the power button and the volume buttons are near the center of the phone, every time I mount this and slide it around, I'm constantly hitting a button. It's causing the camera to start recording when I'm not ready, or it's taking the camera out of record mode. And so yes, you can buy a cage system, maybe something like the small rigs cage, which will make this much easier to mount. But if you're gonna take Lee's stance in this argument that the best camera is the camera that's always on you at all times, are you really gonna outfit the phone that you carry with you all the time with some kind of rig system that's gonna make this even bigger and bulkier? I don't think so. And like I mentioned earlier, one advantage that the iPhone does have is it's got the largest screen of all of them. So taking footage on an iPhone is a much more pleasurable experience when you're looking at the back of the screen, but because it doesn't have a forward facing screen, it makes framing things up when you turn the camera around really difficult. And it's also much more prone to break because this entire thing is made of glass. Of course, the iPhone doesn't have a micro SD card, which normally wouldn't be a problem because you have so much memory built into the phone itself. But I have to say, Apple's filing system is one of the worst of any product I've ever used. Sony is probably a close second. It is impossible to find footage, and it's even harder to transfer it if you're a PC user. That said, if you're a Mac user, AirDrop is amazing, but again, I hate how Apple makes their products harder to use for people that are outside of their ecosystem. Luckily, GoPro and DJI have made a very easy filing system. When you plug into this camera or take the memory card out, there is just like one or two folders, and it's very clear where your files are. They're always named the exact same name in order. You can find the file that you took yesterday or the file that you took today. It is super easy. As for the iPhone, it is an absolute nightmare trying to pull files off of this hard drive because they're named something different. They never sort in the right way. If you've taken slow motion footage and then footage in the regular camera app or maybe a third party app, it stores it in all of these different folders and it is just a nightmare unless you're a Mac user. Now I did just say that the iPhone is the best camera with storage because depending on what phone you bought, you might have up to a terabyte of storage built into the phone itself. The GoPro only has a micro SD slot, which is kind of the norm, right? But the DJI Action 5 Pro, it also has built-in memory. With all the software and everything loaded, you get realistically about 47 gigs of storage on the camera, but if you're like me, and you leave the house with a partially filled memory card or no memory card at all, I absolutely love that you can just start filming and it's gonna save it to the camera. In many cases, I actually prefer that because the transfer rate's so much faster and I hate dealing with those little micro SD cards, but you do get both options if you go with the Action 5 Pro. Now, if you're a photographer and you're looking to capture still images with any of these cameras, the GoPro 13 is shooting 27 megapixel images, the Action 5 is 40 megapixel stills, and the iPhone, depending on which camera you have and which lens you're using, you're going to get at least 12 megapixels, but you might wind up with 24 or even 48 megapixels on the newer cameras if you're using some of the other lenses besides the wide angle lens. Besides the iPhone, I've honestly never used an action camera for stills, so I'm really not that concerned with this. 
All right, let's talk about color modes. The Action 5 Pro has a normal color mode, which is what I've been using in this entire video, but you can also set it to HDR. The Hero 13 Black, it has natural color as well. Again, that's what I set for this video. But then you can also use the HLG 10-bit mode, which is the equivalent of their HDR color mode if you wanna pull a little bit more detail out of the file. Now with the iPhone, I made a pretty big mistake. When Lee reformatted this phone and gave it to me, the factory setting is apparently HDR on. And so all of the footage that I shot out in the field looked amazing on the screen, but then when I brought it into Premiere for this video, I noticed that all of my footage was blown out. And I'm thinking, how in the world can the screen be so far off from what the footage actually was? And then I realized, oh, every clip that I took on the iPhone was shot in HDR which is kind of nice because I can now pull back all of the detail that's blown out. And so instead of going out and refilming days of footage, I just decided to give the iPhone the advantage. And so all of the footage that you've seen throughout this video, the iPhone has been shooting in HDR, so it should have the best looking dynamic range of all of these cameras. Whether or not that's actually the case, well, I'll let you be the judge of that. One thing that I hate about shooting video on the iPhone is the native iPhone app makes it hard to switch settings and sometimes it even reverts the frame rate or resolution back to something else even though I just toggled it to the exact settings that I wanna shoot in. Now you can go into the iPhone settings and choose a frame rate and resolution that you want the camera to kind of resort back to. Apple does have this weird tendency to kind of prioritize 30 frames per second over the more cinematic 24 frames per second. But maybe you have set your camera to 24 frames per second at 4K, maybe to conserve, you know, storage space on your phone. And then you go out to shoot content and you change it over to 4K 60 frames per second. If you accidentally leave the app or you get a phone call or whatever number of things happen, often your phone will then change back to that save setting of 24 frames per second. And if you don't notice it, you might be shooting in 1080 or a lower frame rate than you thought, even though you just changed the settings on the app two seconds ago. This drives me absolutely crazy. In fact, I missed a lot of shots during my review because of this. I like when you make a setting, the camera just keeps those settings. And then maybe when you turn the camera off and then turn it back on, it would resort back to those save settings. But the iPhone is constantly changing back and you, you really have to be on top of it. And I find that really annoying as a content creator. I feel like all of this would be solved if Apple would just make a pro camera app option that performed much more like the Blackmagic app, which I did have to download to shoot a lot of this test footage. But even then, the Blackmagic app didn't always give me access to the frame rate options that I needed, even though the phone was capable of producing those frame rates at that resolution. It's almost as if the iPhone wasn't designed for professionals at all. There's one last thing that I wanna mention here, and maybe if you're using the complete Apple ecosystem, it solves this problem. But every time that I went into the slow motion app and started filming 120 frames per second, the iPhone would then save that file with a normal speed ramp at the first 10% of the footage and the last 10% of the footage. This is cool when you wanna send a text to your friends and you want it to play at normal speed and then all of a sudden slow up. But when you start pulling these files off your phone and start throwing them in a project like Premiere, and you see that now the video file isn't 120 frames per second, it might be 24 frames per second, and it's got that built-in speed ramp and it's already slowed the footage down, it is a nightmare because in many cases, if the clip is short, you might want that first 10% or last 10% to be slow motion, but now it's kind of baked into the file. And the only thing that I've found is if I go into the app, into the editor, and then drag those little sliders so that the entire clip is slow motion, that seems to solve the problem. But if you shoot 30 or 40 clips in slow motion, the last thing I wanna do is start editing all of those on my phone, just so that when I pull them off onto my computer, they're showing up at a true 120 frames per second. I don't know the workaround with that because the only Apple product that I use is literally the iPhone, but maybe this is solved using the whole Mac system. I just wish that they would save the file on the device as 120 frames per second, and then somehow in software, you can do all that cool speed ramping. But if you're a content creator and you're looking just at the highest quality file, I feel like with the iPhone, I'm never sure exactly what I'm gonna get when I transfer it over to my computer. Woo, this review is getting long. All right, before I wrap up this review, there's a few things that I wanna talk about. Let's talk about batteries. Now, unfortunately, the GoPro 13 Black has kept the same power battery, but it has changed the physical shape of the battery. So if you own a bunch of batteries from, I don't know when they started using this, maybe like the 11 or the 12, 
The shape of the battery is almost identical, but they have changed where the connecting pins are. So all of the batteries that you already own, although they hold the same amount of power, will not work with the GoPro 13 Black. Super annoying, I really hate it when camera companies do this. I guess the battery now has been optimized, so hopefully it stays charged a little bit longer, but you're gonna have to buy all new batteries. With the Action 5 Pro, it's using the same battery as the three and the four, so you can definitely use all the batteries that you previously own. With the Action 5 Pro that I bought, I wound up getting this slick little battery pack with it that holds three additional batteries. And what's great about this is you can put all three batteries in here, plug it up with a USB-C adapter, and then you can just charge all three batteries. This is very similar to what you can do with the DJI uh, microphones and also with their drones. You put one connector in, it charges a bunch of batteries. I love this, and if you wind up buying the Action 5, I would definitely recommend getting this battery pack because with three batteries, I think you're gonna be able to film all day, if not two full days. I mean, it's pretty incredible. That said, I have always felt like every GoPro that I own, I have a GoPro 11 over here behind the camera. I feel like the battery life is one of the biggest flaws of the camera in general. As you can see, the footage from this looks great, but the battery life, I always feel like it, it never lasts more than one or two hours kind of using it off and on. And in this week of testing these cameras, I definitely found that to be true. When the GoPro battery died, the Action 5 camera was often at 80% battery life. So somehow I am getting much better battery life on the Action 5. There may be some weird setting where the GoPro is searching for Wi-Fi or something and it's eating up more battery life, but in terms of the front screens being on or off and using them in the same way, at the same frame rates with the same field of view, the Action 5 just worked a whole lot longer than the GoPro. So I feel like my complaints with the GoPro battery still haven't really been resolved. That being said, buy a couple batteries and this thing will still last you throughout the day and then you can charge the other battery really quickly. So it's not a huge deal, but if you're looking for the best battery life, I am really impressed with the Action 5 Pro. If you have an iPhone, especially if you're using the Thunderbolt, you're gonna have the longest battery life because the battery in here is huge, but if you do need to charge this, man, charging on a Thunderbolt cord is incredibly slow, but if you have the newer iPhone that uses USB-C, charging is incredibly fast. So in terms of battery life, I have to say the iPhone is the winner in this category. Maybe that's a little unfair, but I just wanna call it as it is. And finally, one little thing that I find annoying with both of these cameras actually is that the button on the side is the power button to turn these on but they both also toggle through photos, videos, and time-lapse. And so I found myself constantly thinking I was turning the camera off, but accidentally changing the mode to something else like time-lapse. And then the battery is just draining because I thought the camera was off. And then next time I go to use it, lo and behold, it's not in video mode. So for me, I very rarely change these out of video mode into photo mode. So I wish straight out of the box that the side button didn't toggle through all of that. Maybe there's a way to turn that off deep inside the menu, but I found that kind of annoying and uh, just wish the side was a power button only. All right, so what are my final opinions now that I've used all three of these cameras side by side for a solid week? Well, it's probably no surprise for my usage. I actually found that I enjoy using the Action 5 Pro more and I felt like the video quality was better too. The quality in low light was not even comparable. This was by far the best. It's super easy to navigate the menus. In many cases with the GoPro, I found that I couldn't find all of the settings on the screen and so I was having to sync my GoPro to the GoPro Quick app on my phone just to find certain settings. Things like the stable horizon, they're not under stabilization. They're kind of like built into the lens choice, which I found really confusing. With the Action 5, stabilization is just an option that you always go to and you can just toggle between the three or four options that they have. Super intuitive. With the GoPro, I was just searching for a lot of these all the time. Maybe if this was the only camera that I had and I just memorized it, it wouldn't be an issue. But having these all side by side, there is no doubt that the DJI camera was way easier to use. I also love that this has built-in memory because I am incredibly clumsy and many times I have left the house, even during this review, only to find out that my memory card is 90% full 
and I was able to save the day by using the internal memory, which I really appreciate. And like I just mentioned, the battery life was better, and overall, I just felt like all of the footage looked great. Now, there were some problems that I did have with the Action 5. It wasn't a completely flawless camera. Some of the footage that I found, especially even in the daytime when it was super bright, looked a little HDR-ish. It almost looked like it had this high pass filter on it. it. It looked kind of unnatural. It wasn't as clean. Uh, it was like trying to preserve too much dynamic range. I believe this camera, maybe both of these are claiming 13 stops of dynamic range. And one problem with high dynamic range is it comes with a cost. It comes with the cost of it not totally looking natural. Sometimes when you look out and it's a bright sunny day, you, you kind of want the whites to go pure white and you want the blacks to go pure black. And so when you have so much dynamic range that everything is able to be viewed in detail, it starts to look fake. And I just found the footage on the Action 5 sometimes went into that territory. That being said, it's very easy to add a Lumetri color on it and to crush the blacks and maybe blow out some of the highlights and get that footage to start looking good. Whereas on the iPhone or on the GoPro 13 black, if you don't have any of that detail, there's nothing you can really do with it. And in terms of low light, that's definitely the case. With the Action 5 Pro, the footage was usable. It looked great. It might have been a little fakish and, you know, it kind of looked a little artificial, but at least I could use the footage. Whereas with these other cameras, the, the footage was so bad, black and grainy that I just never would throw that in a project to begin with. All right, so now let's answer the question that we started this whole video with. You bought a brand new iPhone and you still have a very capable iPhone sitting in your drawer. Can this be used in place of an action camera? I am going to give an emphatic no. Now Lee likes to make the argument that the best camera is the camera that's on you. But the problem with this argument is that the iPhone that I use personally is going to be the newest phone, which now costs over $1,000 easily. If you want a phone in the same price point as these cameras, you're going to have to buy something that's older and perhaps even used to get it down to the $400, $450 range that these action cameras are priced at. For me, I don't like filling up my personal phone with professional content that I'm filming and then having phone calls and text messages interrupt my filming. So I want a separate content only iPhone, which then means I'm still carrying around two devices when I could just be carrying around one of these action cameras. My biggest worry is always pushing the envelope and capturing really extreme content using my personal phone. If I destroy my main phone, especially if I'm in another country, my entire week is gonna be ruined and possibly more importantly, some memories and documents are gonna be lost forever. Sure, you can buy an underwater housing and you can get a small rig system so you can mount this in a clever way, but who's gonna wanna carry all of that around them when they decide to actually film content? If you're having to buy all of that stuff anyway and add it to your secondary phone, just sell the secondary phone, save the money on the accessories and buy an action camera that's gonna work way better and give you both options if you need them. I know guys, I'm preaching to the choir here and all of you think Lee is just as crazy as I do, but in the event that you feel like the iPhone is more capable, is cheaper, and maybe the footage looked just as good as these two cameras, leave a message in the comments below and tell me just how wrong I am. So there you go. If you have an old iPhone, put that crap on eBay, get the money and buy a brand new action camera. You're not gonna regret it. If you guys enjoy this kind of content, make sure you subscribe to our channel below. If you're a photographer and you wanna put your own work up against some of the work created by the F-Stoppers community, every single month, Lee and I do a critique the community contest where we look at your images from a specific genre, critique them in a video, and at the end, we give a bunch of photographic prizes away. We give away cameras, lenses, editing software, photo accessories, and of course, F-Stoppers tutorials. And speaking of tutorials, if you're a photographer or videographer and you wanna start making money in a specific genre and upping your photographic game, go to fstoppers.com store where you can check out our tutorials that we've produced with some of the best photographers in the industry. We cover everything from landscapes, headshots, swimwear, architectural photography, product photography, fashion photography. There's literally something for everybody. You can use the discount code below to save 15%. And if you want the best deal right now, we just released Photographing the World Japan 2, Discovering Hidden Gems. And with the purchase of this tutorial, you'll get a second Photographing the World completely free. And I'm about to lose my voice because this was a much longer video than I anticipated, but I will see you guys really soon.